eight Republican candidates for president gathered in Milwaukee Wednesday night for the first official debate of the 2024 election cycle. How did it go? Here's a taste. Sorry, that's an absurd fight scene from the movie Anchorman. But frankly, it tracked pretty well with the debate, which consisted of seven ridiculous men in suits bashing each other. Oh, and Nikki Haley, too, who hates identity politics, but spent a lot of the night reminding everyone she's a woman. And a special shout out to Ron DeSantis, who spent much of the night trying to remind everyone he is, in fact, human. We will get the job done, and I will not let you down. Look at that smile, au naturel. Watching the debate, I was actually reminded of a different scene from another television show, Succession, when the media mogul Logan Roy tells his bickering children why they won't inherit his empire. You're such f dopes. You are not serious figures. I love you, but you are not serious people. That is a perfect encapsulation of what went down in Milwaukee on Wednesday night. There was no vision on display, no policy agenda really for America, no meaningful knowledge of the key issues. Just a bunch of semi-well-dressed, semi-well-rehearsed children looking to score points with a Fox audience. But just because they're not serious people, that doesn't mean they're not dangerous. Because how did they score those points? By going full authoritarian. Remember American carnage? Now it's America's dark moment. It is not morning in America. We live in a dark moment, and we have to confront the fact that we're in an internal, sort of cold cultural civil war. That was fresh-faced authoritarianism enthusiast Vivek Ramaswamy, who is polling just behind Ron DeSantis. Ramaswamy declared a cold civil war, but he and his competitors on stage spent much of the night reminding GOP voters that some like it hot. And it turned out there were lots of hot wars to declare, like a war with Mexico. Consider this an invasion. Would you authorize lethal force along that border? We should use those same military resources to prevent across the invasion of our own southern border here in the United States. When these drug pushers are bringing fentanyl across the border, that's going to be the last thing they do. We're going to use force and we're going to leave them stone cold okay. dead. We could finish the wall. For five billion more, we could have the military-grade technology to surveil our southern border. So when they're coming across, yes, we're going to use lethal force. Yes, we reserve the right to operate. Not enough war for you? How about a war on teachers and textbooks? The only way we change education in this nation is to break the backs of the teachers' unions. Let's shut down the head of the snake, the Department of Education. We eliminated critical race theory. I would get rid of the Department of Education. We eliminated gender ideology. We'll also shut down the federal Department of Education. And of course, there was more war to declare on fellow Americans, be they democratically elected prosecutors in Florida, or federal civil servants, or law enforcement officials, or just insufficiently patriotic citizens. We have a crime wave in this country, and we know how to fix it. The question is, do we actually have the spine to do it? These are district attorneys in Florida, elected with Soros funding, who said they wouldn't do their job. I removed them from their post. They are gone. <laughs> and as president, as president, we are going to go after all of these people. The only war that I will declare as U.S. president will be the war on the federal administrative state. First thing I'll do is fire Merrick Garland. Second thing I'll do, fire Christopher Ray. Bring Fauci in, you sit him down, and you say, Anthony, you are fired. What we really need is a tonal reset from the top, saying that this is what it means to be an American. All of that derivative dribble could have come straight from the big guy himself. But where was Donald Trump, the beating heart of this authoritarianism, the man who's drubbing all the people on stage comfortably by 20 to 30 points, the man facing 91 criminal counts in four different U.S. jurisdictions? He was granting an edited sit-down interview to former Fox primetime host and current guy on the platform, formerly known as Twitter, Tucker Carlson, a man who in private says he hates Donald Trump, but who on air asked him probing questions like these. 
Do you think television is declining? Do you think Epstein killed himself sincerely? Are you worried that they're going to try and kill you? Why wouldn't they try and kill you, honestly? I don't need to show you Trump's answers. By now, we're all familiar with his greatest hits. In fact, his challengers were eager to say it all for him. Build the wall, purge the deep state, ban critical viewpoints, use violence as a tool. And then after all that, the front runners on stage again threw their support behind a man who didn't even show up. You all signed a pledge to support the eventual Republican nominee. If former President Trump is convicted in a court of law, would you still support him as your party's choice? Please raise your hand if you would. Notice how Mr. Don't Back Down Ron DeSantis had to look around the room, check what the other candidates were doing before deciding to raise his own hand. To be clear, Donald Trump could be found guilty of serious crimes by multiple juries of his peers. He could be on his way to prison, the first former president in history to not just be charged with a crime, but convicted of a crime. And yet, the majority of the candidates who claim they want to beat him in the race for the Republican presidential nomination, who invoked law and order again and again at the debate, say they'd still back him for the White House if he wins. They would back a convicted criminal who couldn't even be bothered to turn up and share a stage with them on Wednesday night. As Logan Roy says, these are not serious people.